Hello, and welcome to Chronicles of the Doom. Katerina Sforza was born into the turbulent time and place known as the Italian Renaissance, a world of beauty and violence, of artistic grandeur and bloody vendetta. This period is perhaps best known today for the art and architecture which decorates cities like Rome, Florence, and Venice. Italy was situated along trade routes that connected Europe with the East, and its position as a middleman for Oriental trade made it one of the richest regions in Europe. In short, the reason the Renaissance Italy is famous for its artwork is because the people, or at least the wealthy people, had enough wealth to spend on statues and paintings. Will Durant writes, First of all, it took money, smelly, bourgeois money, to pay a Michelangelo to transmute wealth into beauty and perfume a fortune with a breath of art. This money, smelly though it was, was supplied by merchants, bankers, rulers, and the church. Much of the art that Renaissance Italy is famous for was in fact commissioned by the Catholic Church. So what we have in Renaissance Italy is a very rich region that lacked political unity. As such, the major powers of Europe at the time, mostly Spain and France, often invaded the area. The Italian rulers were far too busy fighting with each other to stand up against foreign invasion and often formed alliances with the invading powers. In addition to the external threats, Italian rulers were also wary of their own populace. Dozens of Renaissance leaders were assassinated by their own people. It was into this world of power politics and intrigue that Caterina Sforza was born in the year 1463. She was illegitimate, or if you watch Game of Thrones, she was a bastard. She was the daughter of Galeazzo Maria, the ruler of Milan. Due to her father's wealth and power, she was able to enjoy a luxury unknown to most women of her time, a top-notch education. She learned to read and write in Latin, as well as more practical skills like writing and hunting. Now, being the daughter of a powerful man like the Duke of Milan brought both benefits and drawbacks. Though she enjoyed luxurious living and an education, she could be used as a pawn in her family's political machinations. At the age of 10, she was engaged to a man nearly twice her age. This man was named Girolamo Riario. He was the nephew of the Pope, Sixtus IV, and that's about all you can say for him. Formerly a customs official, he received high office upon his uncle's election to the papacy. Now, it was common practice in this time for the Pope's relatives to receive money in high positions in the church. Interestingly enough, the term nepotism comes from a word meaning nephew. Now, the Pope and his family were relatively obscure, and as such, they wanted to make alliances with other powerful Italian families. In those days, the way to make such an alliance was through marriage. The marriage of Caterina and Girolamo symbolized an alliance between Rome and Milan, between the Sforza family and the Riario family. However, before the marriage could take place, Caterina was struck by a personal tragedy. Her father, the Duke, was stabbed to death while attending Mass. The conspirators' motives were political as well as personal. Some of them wanted to make Milan a republic, while one, a man named Old Giotti, wanted to avenge his sister, who had been seduced and then abandoned by the Duke. Machiavelli, a political theorist of this time period, wrote that the major danger of assassinating your enemies is that you will leave someone alive who wants revenge. Upon the Duke's death, his wife, Bona of Savoy, took power in Milan as regent for her son, Gian Caliazzo. One of her first acts as regent was executing old Giotti, the man who had killed her husband. He was brutally tortured on the rack, his bones broken, and his skin flayed from his flesh. Despite this, he refused to repent. His last words were morza serba, fama perpetua, meaning, death is bitter, but fame is eternal. I suppose he was right. I mean, it's been 500 years and we're still talking about him. This was one of the pivotal moments of Katerina's life. In addition to losing her father, she was able to see her mother-in-law, Bona, 
take the reins of power. It was an act that Katerina would emulate in the future. Despite the tragedy of her father's death, life continued on in the form of her arranged marriage to Girolamo. At the age of 14, she left her home in Milan to join her new husband in Rome. Her new uncle, Pope Sixtus, arranged a royal welcome for the young noblewoman, as she was escorted into Rome by 6,000 horsemen. The historian Ernst Breisach writes, Caterina and Girolamo began their life together in Rome, a city with little of her ancient grandeur, of a fading medieval piety, and none yet of Renaissance splendor. Only its importance as the headquarters of Holy Mother Church prevented the city from falling into utter provincialism. And so Caterina began her life in the papal court. She played the part of a dutiful wife while learning more about palace intrigue. She was a part of the Pope's inner circle, and it was said that Sixtus had a hard time saying no to his young niece. Sixtus, for his part, was a decent man who worked to improve the lives of his people. The Hospital of Santo Spirito was built during his time as Pope. In addition, the Sistine Chapel was built during his papacy, though it was not until after his death that Michelangelo painted the ceiling. In 1478, Caterina gave birth to her first child, a boy by the name of Ottaviano. While Caterina grew and began raising her child, her husband schemed and plotted. Specifically, he plotted against the Medici, the ruling family of Florence. Giuliano and Lorenzo de' Medici were attending mass when they were set upon by a pair of priests. Giuliano was killed, but Lorenzo escaped with minor injuries. Remember earlier when I talked about Machiavelli and how assassins shouldn't leave anyone alive to seek revenge? Well, the assassins didn't read their Machiavelli. They were hanged publicly, and the Medici's hold over Florence was of anything more secure than it had been before. During this time, the two most powerful families in Rome, the Orsini and Colonna, were engaged in a feud that was reaching a boiling point. Girolamo favored the Orsini, and this dispute took on the character of a civil war in the Papal States. The Colonna Palace was sacked, and Lorenzo Colonna, a powerful member of the family, was tortured and beheaded after a forced confession. Ernst Breisach writes, Out in the Roman night, Colonna had become a dirty word. The soldiers of the church and the Orsini, and the ordinary street mob, took their revenge for the wrongs, real or imagined, the Colonna had done. However, this state of affairs would not last very long. In the summer of 1484, Pope Sixtus died, leaving Caterina and Girolamo without their power base. The violence that had been inflicted on the Colonna would soon be on their heads. It was something of a tradition in Rome that the death of the Pope was followed by rioting and violence. The family of the former Pope was often the target of reprisals, and this was no exception. The Colonna flooded back into the city, and the palace where Caterina and Girolamo lived was looted and destroyed. This was a moment of truth for Caterina and her family. They all stood at a precipice and could have lost everything they had gained in the past few years. Caterina, though she was seven months pregnant at the time, got on a horse and made for Rome, a city filled with looters that wanted her family's blood. She entered the Castel Sant'Angelo, the Pope's main fortress in Rome, tossing out the commander. Now, the Castel Sant'Angelo has a long and storied history, dating all the way back to ancient times. It was built by the Roman Emperor Hadrian as a mausoleum for himself and his family, and was later converted into a fortress. The round, drum-shaped building commands excellent views of the bridges across the Tiber River, standing between the Old City and St. Peter's. Caterina holding this fortress meant that the College of Cardinals, the body tasked with electing the new pope, wouldn't enter the city. Caterina said that she would only yield the castle to the next pope, as the cardinals wouldn't want to elect someone hostile to Caterina while she held the fortress. Unfortunately for her, the College of Cardinals found a way to get around her. They got to her husband and offered him cash and a promise to let him keep command of Fort Lee and Imola. He prepared to leave the city, essentially leaving Caterina in the lurch. Caterina, politically isolated, decided to leave as well. On October the 25th, 1484, Caterina yielded the Castel Sant'Angelo to the College of Cardinals. A sword belt hung from her hip as she rode out of the fortress. 
The people of Rome crowded around to see the woman who had the audacity to stand against the College of Cardinals. Thanks to her efforts, her family had secured their position. The new pope, Innocent VIII, allowed the Riario to keep their lands, but they were no longer a part of the pope's inner circle. From this point on, Caterina and Girolamo would focus on ruling what remained to them, the towns of Forli and Imola. These were two small towns northeast of Rome in an area that was known as the Romagna. This area was often at war, as the larger powers of Italy were often fighting each other for control of the area. There is a passage in Dante's Inferno where the poet tells a resident of the area that, quote, This Romagna of yours is not and never was without war in the heart of its tyrants. The former d- ruling dynasty would always have to worry about them trying to regain power. The insecurity of their reign was such that there were dozens of attempts to assassinate Girolamo during his reign. Now, Girolamo had tried to win over his subjects by lowering taxes and providing cheap grain to the people. This policy made him popular in the short term, but without the wealth of the church to support them, the Riario family couldn't afford it for very long. Girolamo was forced to raise taxes, which further alienated his subjects. Caterina, meanwhile, adjusted to her change in surroundings. At this point, she had spent most of her life in either Milan or Rome, which were major players in Italian politics, and moving to Forli was quite a change for her. Now, nothing against Forli, it's a very nice town, but it's not Rome. Caterina would have to adapt to the life of a provincial noble in the Styx. She worked to maintain her family's image among the people. For example, when the plague hit Forli, she personally visited the sick and offered them food and medicine. However, this was not enough to stem the never-ending cycle of conspiracy and vendetta that plagued Renaissance Italy. Girolamo finally inherited the wind in 1488. Members of the Orsi, a minor noble family in Forli, began to plot against their count. The bone of contention between the Orsi and Girolamo was over 200 ducats that a member of the family owed the count. Worried that the count was about to move against them, the Orsi decided to strike first. Unlike the other assassinations we've talked about today, this one took place not in a church, but in Girolamo's home. Several members of the Orsi family met the Count, offering to repay him. Once they got close enough to him, they pulled out daggers and stabbed the Count of Forli to death. His body was thrown into the square so the people of Forli could see what had taken place. With the Count dead, the assassins moved to secure the palace in the Riario family. Their palace was looted by the people of Forli as the Orsi took Caterina and her children as hostages. Now at this point, I should note that it's pretty amazing that they weren't killed instantly. As horrible as that sounds, the Orsi would have no hope for success as long as the Count's family was alive. However, they hesitated. Perhaps this was due to the fact that Caterina's uncle Ludvico controlled Milan and would likely retaliate against them. The Orsi family had few allies and were unlikely to withstand an assault from Milan. Also, forces loyal to the Royario family had secured the main fortress, a castle by the name of Ravaldino. The Orsi decided to hand control of Forli over to the church, which would allow the people there a degree of independence. A bishop by the name of Savelli was sent in to supervise the transfer of power. The commander of Ravaldino offered to surrender the fortress on one condition, that Caterina be sent in first to negotiate and write him a letter of recommendation for his next employer. Savelli sent Caterina into Ravaldino to encourage their commanders to surrender. However, once she was inside the fortress, she revealed her true plans. Now, accounts differ on what exactly was said at this point. The most reserved, believable version is that upon entering, Caterina gave the Orsi the fig, which was the Renaissance equivalent of the middle finger. The less credible, believable version states that she pulled up her skirts and told the Orsi that though they had her children, she had the means to make more, and these children would hunt them down and take revenge. Like I said, this probably didn't happen, but it makes for an interesting story, so believe what you want to. At any rate, from the moment Katerina entered the fortress, the tide had turned against the Orsi family. 
Katerina's uncle Ludvico ruled in Milan, and she was friendly with the rulers of Bologna. The Orsi, meanwhile, had few friends and only a tenuous hold over the city. Once an army friendly to Katerina had arrived, the Orsi realized their position was hopeless. The family members that could flee did so, leaving the women, children, and elderly members of the family behind to face Katerina. Surprisingly to the people of Forli, Katerina prevented her uncle's troops from sacking the town. She didn't want to see her people robbed or raped by the soldiers, instead focusing her anger on those who had killed her husband. Andrea Orsi, the elderly patriarch of the family, bore the brunt of said fury. He had argued for the death of the former Count's family, including Katerina and her children. He had read this Machiavelli, and he knew that if they stayed alive, they would take vengeance on the Orsi family. He was dragged by a horse through the streets of Forli, serving as a warning to the people. The Orsi palace was burned to the ground after being looted by the townspeople. Katerina's hold over Forli was secure. Though at this point she was technically only her son's regent, Katerina was the real power in Forli. She was the one making the day-to-day -day decisions, and she placed people loyal to her in key positions in government. One such loyal ally was the former stable boy Giacomo Feo, who was given command of the fortress that Caterina had just defended, Ravaldino. Around this time, about 1491, she began an illicit romance with him, but since he was of low birth, they had to marry in secret. Unlike her first marriage, it appears that Caterina and Giacomo were actually in love with each other. However, the nobles of Forli disapproved of their relationship due to Giacomo's humble birth, also, her son Ottaviano, the nominal ruler of Forli, may have resented them both for ruling in his place. However, Caterina would be preoccupied as changes began to take place in Italy and the wider world. 1492 was a monumental year in human history. Of course, it was the year Columbus made his famous voyage to the Americas. However, it was significant to Caterina for more immediate reasons. In 1492, Rodrigo Borgia was elected to the papacy, taking the name Alexander VI. This was the beginning of the ascendancy of the House of Borgia in Italy. The Borgia were a family originally from Spain that had risen through the ranks of the church in the 1400s. Their ambition created more than their share of enemies, and critics accused them of everything from poisoning to incest. I'm not going to guess about their bedroom habits, but I can state fairly conclusively that the Borgia wanted to carve out a dynasty for themselves in Italy. Pope Alexander's son was Cesare Borgia, and he and Caterina would cross both paths and swords soon enough. Meanwhile, across the Alps in France, Charles VIII became king. Charles had two things that would spell danger to Italy. He had control of the French army and a claim to the throne of Naples. The trouble started when Milan went to war with Naples and invited the French into the peninsula. Remember, Caterina's uncle was the Duke of Milan. Soon, almost every state in Italy was dragged into the war on one side or the other. Caterina found herself between her overlord, the Pope, who opposed the French, and her uncle, who supported them. To quote Elizabeth Lev, Charles had brought a new weapon to the field, never before seen in feudal Europe, a standing army. Almost 20,000 men in the ranks of infantry, artillery, and cavalry were perpetually on call and ready for battle. This force would steamroll through Italy, aided by Milan. Caterina agreed to side with the Pope in Naples against the French on the condition that they would send troops to protect her lands. However, this help did not arrive, leaving Caterina in the lurch. Once the French army began its move through the Romagna, the decision was made. Charles's army seized one of her fortresses, and with no help coming from her allies, Caterina switched sides and allied with the French. Charles was able to take Naples, but holding it proved more difficult, and he soon returned to France. Caterina was able to stay in power, but tragedy found her nonetheless. While she and Giacomo were riding home from a picnic, one of her retainers pulled out a knife and stabbed him several times. Caterina, demonstrating her killer instincts, raced back to Ravaldina. Now, we don't know for sure who orchestrated the plot. However, we do know what happened to those who held the knives. The retainer was dismembered publicly. His house was burned to the ground, and his family, including a five-year-old son, were killed by soldiers loyal to Katerina. 
The Italian chronicler Leone Cobelli estimated that as many as 38 people were killed in the wake of Feo's death. Caterina continued to rule in Forli, but she was never again able to regain the goodwill of her subjects. She met the man who would become her third husband when a trade mission arrived several years later from Florence, one of the most wealthy and powerful cities in Europe. The man's name was Giovanni de' Medici il Popolo. A member of a cadet branch of the wealthy banking clan, he changed his name to Il Popolo when the family was ejected from the city in a Republican uprising. He was an educated, cultured man, a character vastly different from her previous husbands. Their marriage also tied her to one of the most important families in Italy. The two of them had a son, Giovanni de Bandinieri, who would become an excellent soldier and one who would leave his own mark on history. Despite the return of happiness to her personal life, Caterina would again be threatened by foreign incursion into her lands. Charles had died, but his successor, Louis, who had come to the throne after his death, allied himself with the papacy and the Borgia family which ruled it. Cesare Borgia was given an army of French soldiers and led them down through Italy. Caterina's uncle was deposed in Milan, meaning that he would be unable to help her. In addition, Giovanni, ruler of the nearby city of Pesaro and Caterina's cousin, later abandoned his city in the face of Cesare Borgia and his troops. While all of her relatives fled, Caterina chose to stand and fight. Cesare Borgia quickly took the town of Forli, which the townspeople passively accepted. However, the fortress of Ravaldino once more protected Caterina and her family. She settled in for a long siege. Now, this wasn't quite the doomed effort that it might seem. Sieges were difficult. The attacking army had to be fed and housed and clothed for the duration, which was very expensive. Also, there was the ever-present threat of a relieving army coming and trapping the besiegers against the castle walls. With a bit of luck, Caterina may have succeeded in waiting the Borgia out, or at the very least delaying their advance through the Romagna. However, Cesare Borgia was able to keep his army fed and paid, and continued to wear down Caterina's walls with cannon fire, a new advance in warfare. After weeks of continuous bombardment, the wall of Ravaldino was breached. The morale of the defending soldiers ran out, and Cesare's soldiers entered the fortress. Machiavelli argued that Caterina focused too much on fortification, and not enough on gaining and keeping the loyalty of her people who turned over to Cesare as soon as he arrived. Caterina did not receive gentle treatment from her captors. She was a hostage of Cesare Borgia, who said that Caterina defended her fortress more than she defended her virtue. Cesare tried to pass off his rape of a noblewoman by saying that they were lovers. The French commander objected to this, saying that it was legal to take women as prisoners of combat. Florence also objected to the ill treatment of one of its citizens. After a time in Cesare's captivity, Caterina was taken to Rome as a prisoner. She was kept in the home of a noble family and treated fairly well. That was until she tried to escape. She was then thrown into a dungeon in the Castel Sant'Angelo, the very fortress she had seized all those years earlier. The Borgia family originally planned to put Caterina on trial for supposedly trying to poison the Pope. The plan was to discredit and humiliate her. However, this plan was quickly abandoned when they found out that Caterina was planning on defending herself. She had a long list of the crimes the Borgia family had committed against her, and they weren't keen on having their dirty laundry revealed publicly. Her son, Ottaviano, renounced his rights to Forli and Imola, having little interest in holding the lands that Caterina had fought for. His letters effectively told her that she was on her own, while not asking Caterina to intercede with the Pope to get him a cardinal's hat. In 1501, the commander of the French forces in Italy, shocked at the way Caterina had been treated, negotiated her release on the condition that she renounce her claims to her lands. Caterina moved to Florence after her time in captivity, spending much of her time in a convent with an order of religious women known as the Murate. While Caterina lived on quietly, the Borgia dynasty fell from power when Pope Alexander died in 1503. His son Cesare was left without a base of power. 
Soon afterwards, the College of Cardinals elected Julius II, an enemy of the Borgia family, and a cousin of Caterina's deceased husband, Girolamo. Cesare lost his lordship over the Romagna and was taken captive and sent to Spain, dying there in 1507. In the wake of the Borgia dynasty's collapse, Caterina wrote to the Pope, asking that her son be reinstated as ruler of Forli, but this never materialized. Caterina spent the majority of her time raising her son Giovanni. As the decade wore on, she battled with illness and eventually fell terminally ill with pneumonia in 1509. Her last words were that if she could tell all, she would shock the world. Her son Giovanni grew into a great condottiere, or mercenary captain. He died young in battle. He left a son, Cosimo, who would come to rule Florence. He decorated Caterina's tomb with a large marble slab to honor her memory. In addition to these physical monuments, Caterina lived on in story and features in a poem known as the Lament of Caterina. It reads, Ah, you frightened Italians, I will stand with my armor. I would rather lose in battle and die with honor. Before I'd be sent to wander with my children throughout the world and sink shamefully into oblivion, I'd sooner be tortured and killed. Listen to this broken-hearted plea. I am Caterina of Forley. This has been Chronicles of the Doomed. Thank you for listening.